into our speaker series this fall because of the massive role that they play in our political economy. And so tonight we're gonna to be hearing um, from Professor Kent Greenfield. And then next month we'll be hearing about uh, different, different forms, corporate forms, and how to democratize our economy more through corporate governance. So please come back a month from now uh, for the second in, in the series, or actually it will be the third in the series. So how did we get here? Are corporations people? I know I'm a creature of Mitch and Carol. And corporations are a creature of state law. Somehow we are both people? I have a definite end of life at some point, hopefully later than sooner, and corporations could potentially live in perpetuity. So what is it about these people? Are we creating super people, immortal people with corporations? Um, I'm dying to hear the answers uh, to whether or not corporations are people and, and how they could act like it. And right now I'm gonna turn it over to the president of the business law students to do the introduction of our speaker tonight. Hello, uh, my name is Justin Cooper. I'm here tonight on behalf of the Business Law Society to introduce you all to Mr. Kent Greenfield. Kent is a professor of law and Dean's Distinguished Scholar at uh, Boston College Law School where he teaches constitutional law and corporate governance. Uh, Kent has a number of distinctions, distinctions. Among the many, he has authored three books, including Corporations Are Two and Should Act Like It are people too and they should act like it. Besides being well published, Kent clerked for Justice David H. Souter of the US Supreme Court and practiced law at Covington and Burling. Kent graduated from Brown University and University of uh, Chicago uh, Law School. With that being said, please join me in welcoming Kent Greenfield. Thank you. Thank you. Is my mic on? Do you hear me if I walk a step away? Very good. So good to see everybody here. Uh, and I know it's not just my brilliant words that, you, that brought you here, it's also the food. So, so feel free to keep eating and, and, and drinking as you, as you see fit over the next, um, I, I, think I've, I think I've got um, two and a half hours before the Red Sox game starts, so I, I won't, I, I'll give, give me enough time, I'll, I won't occupy that entire time but uh, we'll, I'll give you enough time to get from here to, to, to a t television so you can watch the Red Sox win game one um, later, on, later on tonight. Um, um, yeah, so uh, thank you so much for inviting me to the, the, the most beautiful law school in the country, probably the world. I've been to a lot of law schools uh, over, my, over the course of my career, and this is, uh, this is undoubtedly the, the, in the most beautiful setting. I love being in Vermont. I love being in this law school. Um, uh, my, my dream someday is to, is to own a vacation home in Vermont. So I want you to buy as many of my books as possible <laughs> so that you can um, help me realize my lifelong dream of, of having a little cabin somewhere in the woods uh, up, here, up here in Vermont. So let me, um, let me speak to you a little bit for a moment so, uh, about corporations. So I, I'm going to spend some time talking about the um, uh, sort of the, the the big picture. Talk a little bit about the case called Citizens United, which brought this to everybody's uh, mind in 2010. Then I'll talk some about um, why we might want corporations to be uh, people or to have constitutional rights. And then I'll talk about what I think the, we ought to be doing in order to encourage corporations to be more like people. But first, let me tell you about why I'm here or why I even wrote this book. Um, so I, I grew up in a small town in Kentucky, in western Kentucky. I was talking to uh, Melissa about this just a moment ago. My, my mom was a school teacher. My dad's a, a Southern Baptist minister. My grandfather was a coal miner, uh, beginning at the age of 17. Uh, he spent the next 50 years or so getting up every morning and going by tram or by elevator 
um, or walking down into a pit in the earth and mining coal. And I remember um, him sitting me down one afternoon and talking about how you, know, uh, you can't trust companies, you can't trust businesses, that unions saved his life. Um, and I, 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 one of my earliest memories, in fact, is going with my grandmother to the, to the company store, the store owned uh, by, the, by the coal company, the Island Creek Coal Company, in her hometown of Morton's Gap, Kentucky. Um, and the, the store, Erlington, Kentucky, actually, sorry. Uh, it's my father's from Morton's Gap, my mom's from Erlington, Erlington, Kentucky, where she, uh, at, we got to the checkout counter and she pulled out a book, uh, a book of coupons and, and it's not, it wasn't um, uh, food stamps, it was Scrip. This was back in the old days when coal companies paid their workers with coupons uh, that had some kind of a cash value that you could only use at the company store. And so, of course, it was a completely controlled uh, system that allowed the coal companies to exploit the workers, pay them in script that then they could use in their overpriced uh, grocery stores. So that's one of my earliest memories about the, about the greed of companies and how, it, how they kept people in line by um, constraining them and, and, and limiting them. Fast forward, uh, you know, a good 30 years, and one of my, early on in my legal career, there was a, um, something that was called the, the Solomon Amendment that was passed by Congress. Sol the Solomon Amendment was a, was a law that Congress passed that required universities to allow uh, military recruiters on the campus. Now, at the time, um, most law schools in the country excluded or limited military recruiters on campus because they discriminated against our gay and lesbian students. Uh, my, and, and so when the, the Congress passed the Solomon Amendment, most law schools um, caved and said, okay, we'll let you on campus even though you're discriminating against our students and even though you're, you're uh, acting contrary to what we ask every other employer to do. S students came to me and convinced me, uh, make a long story short, to, to sue, to sue the Pentagon. This is in the early 2000s. We were about to uh, enter into war with, with Iraq. Uh, so, I, it, but, so no law school wanted to be out front and, and the named plaintiff, right, to suing over gay rights in a time of war. It wasn't a uh, very popular topic or a to popular cause. So what did we do? We created a corporate entity, a nonprofit entity called FAIR, Forum for Academic and Institutional Rights, that law schools could join. Vermont Law School was joined this organization that I helped create to sue the Pentagon at the time of war over gay rights. We needed a, uh, a, a body uh, that could organize this association of law schools to, to sue the Pentagon. And we won in the Third Circuit and so we were, we were all like full of ourselves for a while, um, and then we lost unanimously in the Supreme Court. Now you may have these, this case, um, this case in, uh, I, I teach this case still, it's in a bunch of con law case books, it's a case about unconstitutional conditions, it's a case about associational rights, it's a case about forced and coerced speech. It's not really, I don't really enjoy teaching it since, um, for obvious reasons. Um, you know, yeah, students, this is the case that I lost eight to zero. Um, and it would have been nine to zero if there, if there had been nine justices. Uh, so, but uh, I, I think back on that as a, as a, uh, as a important part of my own career. But notice what it was. It was the use of a corporate entity to sue on behalf of an association of people fighting for gay rights in a time of war, in a, in a really unpopular moment. And so in a way, for a long time, I had these two uh, strands in my career. I, had, um, I did corporate law and I did constitutional law. And, like, uh, and even compared to, uh, to most law professors, I was, that made me even more of an oddball than most law professors. Uh, so, and, and so, the, the, so I was doing corporate stuff and also was doing constitutional law stuff. And I had to make up you know, stories about why are you interested in both? And then 2010 happened. In 2010, the court decided Citizens United versus Federal Election Commission. And Citizens United is the case 
I'll talk about it in a, more in a moment, in which the court upheld, I'm sorry, struck down a statute that limited corporate uh, expenditures in elections. So um, that was, in many ways, in many respects, horrible for the, for the country, but it was great for my career because, um, because it for, you know, for once it, it let people, um, it let it, let me explain that you know actually these things had had some relevance. The, my corporate law expertise and my con law expertise so came together in this one case, and there um, there are not that many law professors who do both around the country, and and so I, being one of those few who do both, wanted to think about how these things should inter interrelate, and that is the story of how this book. Corporations are people too, and they should act like it um, ha has come about. Because this is really a book about, that sets out um, a vision of, of what I think in, in both in the constitutional law space and the corporate law space with regard to these big economic entities that we call corporations. Okay, so that's, that's all by way of just getting us to the to square one. Um, so I've got, so, so the big question that we all want to ask based on, on um, these, these cases are whether corporations are people. So can we, can everybody, well, not everybody can see this, so I, I won't assume that you will because you, people are in the back. Um, but let's talk about the facets of corporate personhood. Because when we say, when we ask the question, are corporations people, it actually is asking a bunch of different questions at the same time. Uh, it is. It is not the case that that this is a this is an easy question that easily fits on a poster or a bumper sticker. Shocking, right? Like like things are a little more complicated than than what you might see on a bumper sticker. Um, so so I, there are at least three ways in which corporations are people. Now f the first way is you know is actually pretty uh, e well known. It's just that they have legal status. And this is, we, this is uncontroversial. We all like this, right? We like the fact that corporations can sue and be sued. Um, and, and so when we, they are legal persons under the law. When, uh, when, B, when BP uh, pollutes the Gulf of Mexico with hundreds of thousands of barrels of oil, we want to be able to sue BP and not the hundreds of thousands of shareholders of BP. The BP itself, is a legal entity and has the ability to, to sue and be sued. And that is a good thing, whether you're conservative or progressive. Uh, the other way that in which corporations are people, corporations are made up of people. And I, you know, Mitt Rom I was not a fan of Mitt Romney, don't get me wrong, but when he said corporations are people, my friend, I think that's what he meant, that corporations are made up of people, right? And not all corporations, mind you, because there are, Corporations that, that are that do not have people inside them, but you know a lot of people are uh, a lot of corporations do have people inside them, and I think this is something that uh, put on my corporate law professor hat. We want to encourage corporations to take into account, and I'll talk more about that toward the end of the end of the lecture. We want corporations to take into account the interests of all the people who contribute to their to their wealth and their uh, economic uh, well-being. Uh, and in fact, in Citizens United itself, Anthony Kennedy, who wrote that opinion, never said corporations are people. What he said was that corporations are associations of citizens. He applied an associational um, analog or metaphor to the corporation rather than, rather than a, a personhood uh, a metaphor. And I think uh, if you're a progressive, a political progressive as I am, this is actually something we can run with. Corporations are associations of people and they should act like it and they should take into account the interests of all those people who are embedded in those, in those companies, okay? Uh, the third respect in which corporations are people, and this is the controversial one, is whether they have constitutional rights. Now this is controversial and I think this is the debate that, where, that people, um, you know, our people are having since, since it's united. Do corporations have constitutional rights? Should they have constitutional rights? So as lawyers, when people say corporations are not people, well, of course they're people. We want them to be people. The, the more precise question is whether we want them to have constitutional rights. And here's the answer. Sometimes. 
Okay. Uh, and so let's, uh, so the, the first case, the first big case, is not actually the first case, but the, the first case that is well known that articulated constitutional rights for, for corporations was the Dartmouth College v. Woodward case, which has its bicentennial next year. Right? And that, that's the case where um, Chief Justice John Marshall opines that well, corporations are, are creatures of the state, as Melissa said. They are creatures of the state, and they get whatever rights the state gives them. But then he added a second part of that sentence, if you read that opinion. You get whatever the state gets them or whatever rights that are incidental to their very existence. So the very first case that talked about the constitutional rights of corporations in a, in a major way has a contradiction in it. Uh, they get what the state gives them, except for the ones that they have just by, by, by virtue of existence. That is the question the court has been trying to figure out for 200 years. What are the rights that corporations should get just by virtue of their existence? And I've got a working answer for that, which I'll share in a few moments. But, um, and so this was the, this was the, the issue in, in in Citizens United, but it's not just the issue in Citizens United, it's the issue in current cases like the Masterpiece Cake Shop case from last year. You guys know about this case, the baker. My, my, my five-year-old son asked me a question. Uh, you know, that's, no, that's not news. He's, he's always asking me a question. All right, Daddy, what, what animal would you be if you could be in any animal? Or like, when, when's my Thor costume gonna show up? Um, but the question they asked me the other day was, are all chefs bad, Daddy? I'm like, what, what, <laughs> what? And, 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 uh, and I'm like, Henry, what are you talking about? Why are all chefs bad? He said, well, I heard that two boys wanted to get married and they went to a bakery and couldn't get a cake. Uh, and I'm like, oh. <laughs> Teaching moment, uh, right, right? So, uh, um, so I, I'm, and you know, my, like, my, my kids are the kids of, law, of a law professor and a lawyer, right? So they're like, oh, you know, here's, here's, oh, what do you think of that, Henry? I think that's bad. And my, my daughter said, did the baker get put in jail? And I said, actually, no, the baker won, sort of. Um, and, you know, um, I, I, I actually filed a, filed a brief in that case on behalf of corporate law professors arguing in favor of the couple who wanted to get the cake because on corporate personhood reasons. I'll get back to that in a moment. Um, but, you know, and so I was like, daddy was involved in that case. I was trying to help the, the two boys who wanted to get married. And I think they thought in their head, daddy, you're my hero, but they didn't say it. Uh, uh, but I, I, I could tell from my driver's side seat that they were, that that's what they were thinking. Um, so, uh, and, but, but that's, that's, that's a case that draws on this question of whether corporations can have uh, constitutional rights. Another case that's been uh, in the news over the last few years, um, you absolutely cannot see this, but the, the warning labels on, on cigarettes, the FDA had proposed new, more, um, uh, graphic warning labels and the and cigarette companies sued to say that our being forced to put that those warning labels on cigarettes is like forcing school children to say the Pledge of Allegiance. I mean that's that's bogus, right? But uh, they won, right? They won in part because they were able to uh, um, uh, appropriate the First Amendment arguments of individuals as corporations. Okay, so we'll, we'll, uh, so that's that's the that's those are the those are the questions. Now, let's let me tell you a little about about this case that we all sort of mention, but often the facts get lost. So if you've if you've uh, studied this case in your con law uh, courses, forgive me. I'll uh, this this will be. Uh, below the sophistication that you've heard from your professors, but let me just get, uh, in summary, what happened. Uh, what was the law before Citizens United? There were, um, w the one thing is that caps on contributions, if I give money to um, Zephyr Teachout, I, I, uh, that amount can be capped because it's a contribution. And the court says, well, that's the, the First Amendment rights are attenuated and there might be some uh, appearance of corruption. If anybody knows anything about corruption, this is Zephyr Teachout, right? So uh, in, a, in, a, in a good way, not, you know. 
<laughs> she knows about it, she, and whatever. You guys know what I mean. I love her. Um, and, but, uh, but expenditures, right, cannot be capped un, uh, under um, a case called Buckley v. Vallejo that led up to, that was the precursor case. Expenditures cannot be capped because spending money is seen as much more um, connected to First Amendment rights. And I think that's right. I think that's correct as a legal matter. I know we like to say money is not speech. Yeah, and money isn't speech, but neither is burning a flag speech. Uh, but it's considered a speech act. Sometimes spending money is a speech act. When I, con uh, when I spend money, when I, uh, when I contribute money to Planned Parenthood or, or the ACLU or Amnesty International, you, you, I mean, if you, you know, the, the, the causes that we all love and support, that's, that's in part because I'm expressing a point of view, right? So the, the, the court says, well, expenditures are much more, uh, are closer to, to your First Amendment rights and there's less of an appearance of corruption. But the court said in a subsequent case about called Michigan v. Chamber of Commerce, uh, I'm sorry, Austin v. Michigan Chamber of Commerce, was that the expenditure cap, the, the expenditure cap can exist for corporations. So that was the issue in Citizens United. It had to do with, it had to do with a, um, a, a film about Hillary this group called Citizens United was a nonprofit corporation, wanted to make it available uh, on, you know, basically video on demand on your, on your, on your uh, cable TV box. And the, the question was whether, uh, uh, and because it was corporate money being spent for the film, and the film was interpreted to be as explicit campaign expenditures, then that would, was barred by the statute. Now there are a bunch of ways that the court could have decided this issue that did not raise the constitutional question. That's what they should have done. But instead, Kennedy goes big. In fact, they, they argue the case twice. The first time they weren't, they realized that, that uh, really what they wanted to do was to overturn the, the Austin v. Michigan Chamber of Commerce case. They had the case argued during the summertime, which is like, just they don't do. And the court issues this big, broad opinion that, uh, that upholds speech rights for corporations. They say corporations are associations of, of, of citizens. They say to the extent that the, uh, that the limits on corporate expenditures is based on shareholder protection, shareholders can protect themselves, which you guys, if you guys have studied corporate law, it's not truly the case. And they, they said that these independent expenditures don't raise issues of corruption. We know that to be false too as an empirical matter. But this last uh, part uh, also ended up uh, meaning that super PACs explode uh, after Citizens United. Not really corporate money, but super PACs uh, are because independent expenditures are not seem to be, seen to be corrupting. This, this is the part of the opinion that uh, subsequent lower court opinions really um, use in order to explode super PAC spending. Uh, but the other thing that, that is important to remember about Citizens United, the statute that was struck down in Citizens United capped both corporate spending and union spending, okay? So that statute is struck down, which means corporate spending is now can be unlimited and union spending can be unlimited. Okay, uh, what happened afterwards? First of all, a huge uh, movement to amend the Constitution to um, end corporate personhood. There, there have been numerous bills uh, introduced into Congress, including by Bernie Sanders, that, that, that uh, articulate the notion that we, corporations should not have any constitutional rights. Cor constitutional rights are for people. There's, a, there's an initiative on the Massachusetts ballot this fall that we'll be voting on in two weeks that calls for a constitutional amendment um, that ends constitutional rights for any artificial entities or aggregations of people. Uh, that's, that's the political move. The second move was that there is an, 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 uh, a torrent of money going into politics now, uh, into electoral politics like never before, based by an order of magnitude through super PACs. So it, like, essentially super PACs didn't, uh, weren't a big player in this space. You know, as of 2008, by 2010, I'm sorry, by 2012, it had exploded. Uh, by 2016, it's over a billion dollars of super PAC spending, a bi like billion with a B. 
so the lot, it's a lot of money. But surprisingly, most of that money has not come from corporate coffers. This is a surprising empirical fact after Citizens United. The biggest spender, corporate spender in 2012 in the uh, presidential cycle of 2012 was Chevron. They spent $2.5 million. I mean, that's a lot of money, right? $2.5 million. You could probably like pay for law school for that, with that. <laughs> um, I could buy like a little cabin in the woods. I could buy the whole woods for that. Um, but in the scheme of things, uh, both compared to what Chevron does, I think it's like one one thousandth of, of uh, percent of Chevron's uh, net income of that year. I, I, I might be one decimal point off, but it's a tiny bit. Uh, it wasn't would not have been enough even to buy a thirty second spot during the Super Bowl of two thousand um, and twelve, and Compared to other spenders that year, it was uh, it, it was swamped. So 2.5 million by Chevron. Sheldon Adelson and his wife, you know the the casino owner, uh, spent about 90 million that term. The Koch brothers, not Coca-Cola, but Koch brothers, spent about 400 million. So the the biggest players in this space, at least in 2012, were high net worth individuals, wealthy people, rich people. 2016 is the same. Uh, most of the spending were from rich people and unions. Surprising, right? Uh, the biggest corporate spender in 2016 was, a, was an energy company that spent a million dollars to a super PAC or contributed a million dollars to a super PAC to support Jeb Bush. Okay? The other candidates uh, didn't get a lot of corporate money. And the, uh, so, so that, that was a million dollars. The largest 50 corp <coughs> excuse me, the largest 50 corporate spenders in 2016 together spent 52 million dollars. SEIU, the union spent 50, 50 million itself, right? The Coke brother, Adelson spent about 80 million. The Koch brothers spent about 800 million dollars. Money in politics is, uh, is a travesty and it's endangering our politics. Make no mistake. But it's not corporate money that's endangering our politics. It's the money of wealthy individuals. And if you think, like, if you are a progressive as I am, Citizens United actually has been a boon to unions and in a way has helped uh, progressive candidates fight back against the onslaught of super PAC money coming from wealthy individuals. If, Union, if Citizens United did not exist in 2012 and 2016, progressive candidates would have been uh, more uh, disadvantaged than, um, than otherwise. Because wealthy individuals, their ability to spend was not affected by Citizens United, but unions' ability to spend had been uncapped by Citizens United. So this is, a, this is like a new, this is an unusual point that people don't usually hear. Citizens United actually helped progressive candidates in the last two presidential cycles. All right, so what do we do? Let's step back for a second and ask the question of whether we should have constitutional rights for corporations, now that you know the setting and the issue involved. As Melissa says, it's a little weird, right? Are corporations people, but let's be more precise, uh, are corporations the, the rightful and appropriate uh, claimants for constitutional rights. How's my time? Are you guys bored or are you guys okay? Good, all right, good. thank you. Um, all right, so if you buy my book, and I hope you buy like a lots of copies, <laughs> you, you know, you can buy them now for Christmas. Um, uh, I, I, all of your family, like your aunts, and you're like your Uncle Pete will probably like one, your Aunt Marge would probably like one. Um, anyway, in my book, I talk about the, there are easy cases and hard cases. You know, there are easy cases, uh, there are easy yeses and there are easy noes. Easy yeses. Absolutely, the, the uh, corporations should ha have property rights protected under the, under the Constitution. 
Why? Because in order for the corporations to do what they need to do from a societal and institutional perspective, they need to be able to be free of unconstitutional takings or uncompensated takings. If, a corp if, if the state of Georgia could tell Coca-Cola, you got to give us our secret formula and we're not going to compensate you for it, nobody would invest in Coca-Cola. If, if the state of Kentucky, the Commonwealth of Kentucky, excuse me, um, said to KFC, you got to give us, give us your secret recipe, which is still held in a vault in Louisville, Kentucky somewhere. Louisville, you got to remember how to, how to pronounce that. It's not Louisville, it's Louisville. All right, Louisville, say it with me, Louisville. All right, now you, now you, now you can travel to Louisville safely. Um, so uh, if you go to Louisville, Kentucky, um, and so property rights you got to have. Due process rights. Corporations have to be able to protect themselves um, in, in court. Uh, be, in order to protect themselves from arbitrary government action. I also think the Fourth Amendment right to be free of uh, warrantless searches and seizures should fall into this place. Do you want Google to have to g hand over uh, everything that's in their servers without a warrant to uh, this president? No. <laughs> I don't. Um, do, you, do you want, do you want um, uh, your local bookstore to have to hand over to an FBI agent, their, uh, the, their, the names of the books that they've sold and to whom they've sold them without a warrant? Me neither, All right? So that's an easy yes. What are, some e what are some easy no's? Corporations should not be able to vote, right? Corporations should not be able to uh, serve on juries. I think corporations should not be able to, uh, I think the court has gotten it right when the court has said they should not be able to claim the right to be free of, of, um, of coerced confession. The right, to, the right to be free of uh, self-incrimination is, is a right that I don't think should apply, that, that should apply to you and me, but should not apply to corporations uh, for, uh, for a number of reasons. But in large part because corporations should not be able to <clears throat> protect themselves from disclosure. Can you imagine if General Motors could defend against suits about rollover, rolled over vehicles or rolling SUVs that roll over by saying, oh, we, we're not going to, we're not going to release these these documents because it's, they're, they're incriminating. Of course not, right? So, so those, those, are e those are easy no's. <coughs> but of course that's not what the, those are not oh, where we disagree. And those are not what makes this stuff interesting, right? There's a bunch of hard cases. Now, religion is a hard case, I think, in certain respects. It's easy in others. Um, I don't think the Masterpiece Cake Shop should have a religious, uh, rights to discriminate against people, uh, mostly because the, the claim in that case was that the baker had First Amendment rights and projected them onto the corporation. Uh, that's actually the absence of corporate personhood. Corporate personhood is separate personality, is separateness, and the, the court got it wrong in Masterpiece Cake Shop and in Hobby Lobby, by the way, which is another case about this, where the court assumed that the corporation had the First Amendment rights of the shareholders, of the owners. And that is the reason why Jack Phillips, the baker in Masterpiece Cake Shop, formed Masterpiece Cake Shop Limited. You can tell by the name of the case, it wasn't about Jack Phillips, it was about his company. Why did he incorporate Masterpiece Cake Shop Limited? To separate himself from Masterpiece Cake Shop for purposes of liability and the like, but he wanted to not be separate from Masterpiece Cake Shop for purposes of the First Amendment. That makes no sense. That was the, that was the, the brief that I helped write on behalf of a bunch of corporate law professors, uh, always an advocate for gay rights and uh, LGBTQ rights and for uh, uh, constitutional fairness, right? Um, so, uh, another hard case is equal protection. Should, should corporations be the recipient of equal protection? Uh, and I think this is hard also. The year I was clerking was actually a, a year in which we had um, uh, uh, the, the Adirond construction case. I don't know if you've seen that in your case books. This was a case about whether the government can set aside uh, contracts or actually give some preference to contractors who use minority, some con uh, minority owned subcontractors. And in that case, the court said, well, that was a violation of equal protection, in large part because they, they ascribed to the company the, um, the race of its primary shareholders. 
And I gotta admit, it never even occurred to me that that, that, that would be a problem of ascribing a race to a corporation. We just assumed that it, it would be. But I actually, I think <coughs> the answer in those cases is not that the corporation has the race of its shareholders, but that any statute aimed at uh, a company based on the race or sexual orientation or sex or gender of a subgroup of that company, employees, shareholders or whatever, would be problematic under equal protection. And if that's not uh, muddy enough, just wait till you read the chapter in my book, okay? Um, now then, the question of fundamental rights, due process, uh, right to marry, right to have an abortion. You would think uh, a corporation should never have those rights, they, right? They don't have a body. They don't have, they never want to get an abortion. They don't want to get married, right? But wait, Planned Parenthood v. Casey, 1992, in which the court upheld uh, Roe v. Wade. Planned Parenthood v. Casey was in a very important case. Planned Parenthood is organized as a corporation. They sued on behalf of their patients, their clients, and I think they ought to have had standing there. So it's not altogether so clear that corporations should not have the ability to sue, for, to, to pursue, and to support fundamental rights. In some cases, they should. And of course, speech. And speech is, is that's, the, that's the brass ring of analysis, right? Like if, uh, to try to figure this out is a, is a hard thing. This is what was at issue in, in Citizen United. This is what, issue, what is at issue in Masterpiece Cake Shop and a bunch of other cases. And, the, uh, and again, here, this is not so easy either. The New York Times is a for-profit, publicly traded company. Of course they should have free speech rights. Of course they should. should. Can you imagine in this political climate that we, in which we find ourselves, if uh, newspapers did not have free speech rights, or if journalists did, but the company didn't, they, you know, the, that would be, um, that would be a travesty. And in fact, constitutional rights for companies and businesses started 50 years ago as a progressive idea. You may have heard the, about the, you may have read the case in your common law um, courses, the Virginia Pharmacy case. The, uh, the case in which the, for the first time the court upheld the, uh, or said that commercial speech has some First Amendment components to it. That was a case that was brought on behalf of uh, pharmacies in Virginia because Virginia was limiting the ability of, of pharmacies to, to, uh, uh, to advertise. That case was brought by Ralph Nader, right? Ralph Nader and Public Citizen uh, argued that it's important for listeners to hear what businesses had to say. And that notion of listeners' rights is something that, have been, ha, that has grown over time and was used in Justice Kennedy's opinion in Citizens United. So this, this again, is, a, um, is, a, is a, uh, not so simple. And in fact, let me just assert that I think in moments like we find ourselves in America today, where politics are tribal, short-sighted, uh, nativist, racist, misogynist, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, sometime, in some respects, corporate voices are mitigating and moderating factors. Corporations have to be seen, have to look in the long term. They have to be more pluralistic. They have to be global. And this sometimes can, uh, can be a positive force. The, the little uh, icon that you see on the board is from an Amazon commercial that you may remember where a priest and an imam are, are coming together for, uh, for tea and they realize that each, they're both getting old and creaky so they both uh, order knee pads for the other through Amazon. But it, but it, but it's, it features a priest and an imam. Like the, one of the newest cover girls is Muslim. Right? Coca -Cola, the Coca-Cola commercial during the 2017 Super Bowl, you may remember it, uh, was America the, the Beautiful being sung by a plurality of, of people uh, of all colors, speaking, uh, singing a bunch of different languages. I watched it the other day and it's still, I mean, like, I'm a weeper. Like, it was just like, oh, it's so, like Coca-Cola, I love Coca-Cola. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, but, it, but it's, 
but it's really, um, so in these kinds of moments, I mean, obviously this is not always the case, right? You don't want to go to Exxon to, to figure out whether we, what we should do with climate change, right? But sometimes Coca-Cola is a much more progressive uh, force in society than the Koch brothers because they have to look at everyone and not just a sliver of, of us. Uh, but let me hasten to say, corporations are not always people, and there are some reasons to make, dis make distinctions. Um, there are ways in which corporations are different from human beings, and this should matter in First Amendment analysis, and it doesn't always, and it should more. Corporations are run by management. Corporations are collective entities, and corporations are economic entities. Those, th those three things should make a difference in some uh, First Amendment free speech analyses, including the notion that because they're economic uh, entities and play in the market, and the market depends on, on accurate information, corporations should not be able to lie, ever. There was a big case that, that uh, came to the court a, a couple decades ago now, maybe 15 years ago now, called Nike v. Caskey, where the Nike had written, uh, you know, there had been allegations at the time of, uh, that Nike was using sweatshop labor, Nike sort of pushed back as a PR uh, matter, sending letters to newspapers and editorials and the like. And the, they were sued under California uh, fraud law, consumer fraud law. And they defended that suit saying, look, you know, this is political speech. Uh, political speech is not subject to fraud law. You can lie and when we talk about politics. I don't know if you have any examples you know, jump to mind. Um, <laughs> But, but lying is, is evident in, in politics. But Nike said, so we can lie too. And the court actually didn't reach the substance of the merits of the, of the, of the um, case. And it was mooted out for various reasons. And thank goodness, because it, by all indications, uh, it looked like they were going to hold that Nike could lie about things if they, if they were lying about politics. I think that would have been horrible. So, I do think uh, that there are ways to distinguish between human beings and, and corporate speakers in, in certain free speech cases, but I think you have to figure them out almost on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, so what do we do about corporate personhood? I do also want to say that there are uh, numerous dangers of co corporate personhood, and, uh, and the dangers really have to do with how money in politics and money in lobbying. Corporations spend way much more money in lobbying than in electoral politics. Uh, and this is something that, that uh, Zephyr Teachout has talked about and Larry Lessig and others. Uh, that the real danger with corporate activity in the political space is not spending money on elections, but spending money to influence legislation and regulation. And if you think about, and this is, I think, where the real problem lies. Uh, because they are able, because of cases like Citizens United, they are able to use money to assert political power. They can get audiences with regulators uh, in agencies. They can get audience with, with aides in the White House. They can get audience with, with uh, Congress people. And they use that political power to, uh, to win legislative victories. <clears throat> and if you're a for-profit company, you don't care whether your victories come in the marketplace or in the legislature, as long as you, if you're able to accumulate that, those economic gains, and especially if the legislative victories create financial gains, you can then uh, push those back into, the, into your lobbying expenses, right? It's a, it's, a, it's a vicious circle, and this is, I think, a real concern. Uh, they can exact economic rents, to use an economic term, uh, by way of their political power. And that is, uh, is an area of real concern. Uh, but this is not an area that's being addressed by these, these anti-corporate personhood amendments, by and large. These are, these are things that, that we have to come at through some other mechanism. So what is the mechanism? What is the real danger here? The real danger is, uh, you, those of you in back can't see this, this is a New Yorker cartoon, this is, I too hate being a greedy bastard, but we have a responsibility to our shareholders. <clears throat> so now let me put on my corporate law hat for a second. The real danger in the way we organize corporations in America is not that they speak, but for whom they speak. And in a way, we've got the perfect storm. We have a, 
uh, a corporate law regime and a legal framework that, that requires corporations or through law and norm to act on behalf of shareholders and the managerial and financial elite. Wall Street, not Main Street, to use an oft overused metaphor, okay? And this requirement on the, on, through law and norm that, that corporations speak for these people is turbocharged through their political abilities and political um, powers as recognized in cases like Citizens United. So we have like this perfect storm, a corporate law norm that says you gotta work on behalf of, 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 of the 1% the in America, and then a constitutional law framework that says, all right, there's, there's no real limits to your, uh, that society can place on your ability to, uh, to ex exert that power. So how do we break that cycle? How we break that cycle, I believe, uh, is to make corporations more like people, to make corporate personhood real. So in other words, to break this cycle, we break it not on the constitutional law side, but on the corporate law side. Corporations should be more like people. They should care more about the people in the, the firm, in the companies. They should act more like people in the sense that they should not act as if only one thing matters. Do you act as if only one thing matters in your life? Of course not. Like if I acted if, as if only one thing matters, I would be like a horrible person. Right, but I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a scholar and I'm a professor and I, I'm a dad and a husband and a son and a friend. Like you gotta do all those and you gotta do all those things well, right? Um, or like enough that your wife doesn't leave you, right? <laughs> uh, or, you, or you, you know, basically, right? So I, you know, hi hon, I know you're being like, like you know, you may, you, you, hi. Uh, <laughs> li, li, live stream to my wife's desk, uh, love you. Um, so, um, I think there's a, a space here for those of us who think that corporations uh, and corporate power is a problem, the way to address it is to, is to use the rhetoric of Citizens United in our favor. Corporations are associations of people. Let's make them more like associations of people. Let's make corporate directors have a fiduciary duty to take into account the interests of not just shareholders, but employees, communities, and the like. Let's put workers on boards of directors. There's this little country in Europe called Germany. Uh, they ha there's like some little like mom and pop companies like Mercedes-Benz, uh, BMW, Siemens. In Germany, 50% of the board of directors is selected by employees, right? Uh, this is something that I did not n learn in my corporate law class at the University of Chicago. Uh, but uh, people think, you know, like investment advisors think that it's called code determination and code de that code determination, the practice of paying attention to employees, putting employees as a part of corporate governance was one of the reasons why Germany um, suffered much less in the global financial crisis than other, co other countries like, like we did. We could do that. Elizabeth Warren has, has proposed an act in Congress uh, that, that says if you're over a certain size, you've gotta uh, be chartered in the, in the, by the federal government, not by the states, and you've gotta put a certain percentage of, of employee representatives on your board of directors. So that's a good idea. I would support that. I do support that. This is the, our, I think this is where we should be putting progressive uh, energy going forward, not in the constitutional space. Uh, so that's my book. I, I, uh, I really appreciate your, your attention uh, and I'm happy to, to take questions. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we're gonna take a Q&A from this fixed mic, so please come line up if you have questions. Do you have a question? Excellent. We already have one person in line, so there's space for more. I'm looking at all my students. Come on up. Uh, thank you again for coming here today. Um, so my question. T tell me your name. Uh, I'm Gordon, I'm a 2L here. Um, so my question is, with the court moving more, markedly towards a conservative 
um, entity in our government. Uh, do you feel that giving more constitutional rights um, or rights in general to corporate entities could be used to undo progressive uh, regulation, much like liberty was used during the Lochner era? Well, that's clearly what's happening now, right? The, uh, the, thank you for, for your question, Gordon. Uh, the First Amendment has become the new due, due process clause. The new, uh, you know, it, in, at the time of Lochner, the due process clause was the clause that, that, that businesses used to, uh, uh, to attack re regulatory uh, initiatives. <clears throat> it's absolutely clear that the First Amendment is what, the, what corporations are using now to fight against regulatory initiatives. Uh, uh, John Coates at Harvard just did a study a couple years ago where he found that half of all First Amendment plaintiffs, First Amendment cases, are being brought now by corporations and their trade groups. Corporations are giving the First Amendment a bad name. Uh, and, and, uh, and as Elena Kagan said last year in dissent in, the, in, the, in Janus, the, the union case, the, <clears throat> the right in this country are rep, uh, is, is weaponizing the First Amendment in ways that I think are, are travesty. Now, I, I don't, uh, so I, I think one of the problems is that this court is so ham-fisted and so simplistic libertarian, simplistically libertarian, <coughs> excuse me, uh, with, when it comes to uh, free speech law, that they're just, they're, they're making a bunch of mistakes. Uh, do I think that the answer to that is a constitutional amendment? I don't. I do think that the court is getting a bunch of it wrong. I think if the court uh, uh, read my book, they would get more of them right. Uh, and. Uh, and I think when you all become judges and senators and Congress people, uh, you should you should have, you know carry your five copies of the book that you purchased tonight uh, to your office so you can you can uh, it, it, so know what to, know what, how to decide these cases. But I, I do think that the court is 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 going off the rails when it's in its free speech um, analysis and doctrine these days. They're being too simplistically libertarian. Well, we've got a big line of questioners, Good. but I'm going to just jump in with a follow-up on and that. Tell me your name. On the First Amendment. Um, and, you know, in Vermont, the legislature here, for some reason, believes in label laws and educating the, the consumer. Uh, and those have been the subject of First Amendment right. cases, uh, famously. And so how do you, do you have any advice for uh, advocates who want to put labels on things to advise to uh, advise them about how you get out from under the compelled speech right issue. Uh, so I, again I think this is a place where the court has just been way too simplistic and this is a place where the analysis that I put forth um, uh, here where you have to now analyze these cases according to uh, two questions What's the purpose of the right, and what's the purpose of the entity? Now, the purpose of a, of a corporate entity is to sell um, services and stuff. The, how you sell services and stuff in an open market economy is you got to be truthful about it. Uh, I do not think a corporation has a First Amendment right to to not disclose something truthful about their product. Now, I I think that a corporation might have a First Amendment right to not disclose something. Uh, an opinion with which they don't agree. I think it would be a violation of the First Amendment, for example, for, for Vermont to require every company to fly a rainbow flag, because some companies don't agree with what the rainbow flag stands for. But do I think it's a First Amendment violation for a company to be forced to tell the truth on a label? I do not. And I, I, I do have a bunch of in, in my book about that. You should buy five copies. <laughs> Hi. Um, I'm Charlotte, I'm a master's Thanks, student in Professor Scanlon's legislation regulation class. Um, I have two questions, uh, but one, the second one ties into the first. My first question, uh, the, uh, the saying, we should overturn Citizens United has become kind of a rallying cry for a lot of politicians on the left, for example, Bernie Sanders. Um, so I wanted to know, in your mind with your nuanced knowledge of this particular issue, what would overturning the Citizens United decision actually mean? Like, what would count as a victory in that field? Uh, my second question regards a specific ballot measure in Massachusetts. I think it's, 
Uh, question number two, yep, question two. Uh, which is to enshrine, I believe in the state constitution, the, you mentioned it earlier, uh, what do you, th what effect do you think if that ballot measure passes, what effect do you think it will have on the rights of corporations? Yeah, all right, so uh, two excellent questions, thank you. Um, the, the, um, uh, remind me of the, the first, what's the tag on the first? Uh, what does Bernie Sanders mean when he says we should overturn Okay, so, here, here, so here's the problem. Um, I think the real problem is Buckley v. Vallejo. I mean, this is inside baseball stuff, but you guys know it. You're inside baseball. The real problem is Buckley v. Vallejo, not Citizens United. The problem is that the cor court said in Buckley v. Vallejo, 1978, five, 1975. Is that right? I'm looking at you. I'm looking at you. Uh, 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 1975, I believe, and it, it said that that uh, you know the notion of of uh, building in an equality norm in free speech law is anathema to the First Amendment, right? It's totally foreign to the First Amendment. Look, Canada uh, reached the very opposite conclusion with regard to their uh, their analog to free speech norms. They said that the free speech their their version of free speech requires there to be an equality norm when, in when it comes to to campaign finance. So I think, oddly, I think Citizens United was a bad decision. But I think if you overturn Citizens United without also overturning Buckley, what you would then do is that you would end up putting back on the cap to union spending while letting the Koch brothers and Sheldon Adelson uh, spend as much as they want. <clears throat> and I don't like that because that would, be for, uh, that would mean that progressive candidates would be fighting with a hand tied behind their back. So I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't agree with that. Now, question two is a little more complicated. I, I've, got, I've actually been in touch. I, I know the author of question two pretty well. He and I have gone back and forth on this. Um, <clears throat> he cl claims, and I, and, and, I, and I believe him, you know, I believe that this is what he wants, that question two in Massachusetts really is about setting a, up a commission that would draft uh, an amendment that then, they, that then would be proposed and could get, have legs. And he said to me, uh, Kent, you know, I would want you to be on the commission because you, know, you bring this nuance and, um, and, and it, the, the amendment would not necessarily take away rights from corporations, it would just, it might cap spending, all spending. And I think I would agree with that. The problem that I have, however, is that the wording of question two says that the policy of Massachusetts is to take away constitutional rights for any artificial entities or aggregations of people. And that cannot, that would be a disaster. Aggregations of people include Planned Parenthood, Boston College, the Boy Scouts, uh, you know, um, the, the, through the group that I started to, to sue the Pentagon, right? All those groups would lose their constitutional rights. I think that would be a, that would be a, a bad thing. But thank you for, the, for your question. Hi, uh, good evening, Professor thank Evan you. 1L here. Uh, thank yeah. you for being here. Um, I understand the essence of the analogy about <clears throat> making corporations people too, um, or more closer to people in terms of being more multifaceted and not subject to one singular motive, like the you know, profit motive that people are so critical of corporations about. But it seems to me in this country, uh, we have a constitutional foundation of individual liberty um, and the idea that pay making corporations people in a more constitutional sense would therefore just drive home the point that they could be more, they could take individual liberty for themselves. And I just, I, I just don't quite understand exactly how the idea I'm not trying to be critical. I'm just looking no, for no, more it's, explanation. It's fine for you to be critical, by the way, right? That's well, what, I'm just, I'm just want to further to understand the idea of how treating corporations more like people would make corporations more beholden to the interest of humanity as a whole, as opposed to their own shareholders like they are now? Right. Uh, so thank you for your question, and I think it's a good one. I, uh, here, here's, if you, could bo uh, if you were forced to um, boil my point down to a sentence, like you know, as you give my book to your uncle for Christmas, like what's this about? Well, you would say, you know, well, Professor Greenfield ar argues that if corporations are going to be people, they should act more like citizens. Uh, and I think the notion is that the citizenship stuff can come from the corporate side. Like um, BC, where I work, has a, a center for corporate citizenship. Like corporate citizenship for decades have been, has been something that, that has been seen as a good thing, right? You want corporations to act more attentive to the interest of the world around them. 
The problem with, um, with the way they, it works now is that corporate citizenship is only done in the breach. It's only done when it make, makes sense as a, as a profit make, make, uh, making motive. And I think we can adjust corporate governance norms and laws to make that more enforced or incentivized. For your first point, I don't think it's actually correct to say that the Constitution is only about individual rights. You know, there are uh, notions, there are places in the, in the Constitution where it talks about the rights of people or the rights of persons, but the free speech, it's not, in the free speech clause doesn't say that, right? Um, Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech. It doesn't say abridging the freedom of speech of people. It, it says, you know, uh, Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech or of the press. So even in the, even in the First Amendment, it, in, it assumes I, I see some of you uh, looking at your constitution. I really hope I, I, I quoted that correctly. Very good. Um, it's an it's a occupational hazard. Um, uh, that that uh, it, it assumes, even in the First Amendment, that there are going to be collective bodies called the press that are going to be asserting constitutional rights. So, and I, and I think that makes sense with a bunch of things. The takings clause, for example, in the, in the, in the Fifth Amendment does not uh, limit it to to, it's agnostic with regard to who the, cl who the claimant is. It doesn't say uh, it runs to people or not. Uh, and the places, in some of the places where the Constitution uses the word citizens, for example, in, in Article 3, where it talks about diversity jurisdiction, it talks about citizens, uh, it has been long been assumed that corporations are citizens under the diversity uh, jurisdiction of, of Article 3. And, and in a way that we have to have that be that because the reason why we have diversity jurisdiction is because we don't trust state judge, state courts to to adjudicate fairly of uh, in vis-a-vis uh, vis vis uh, citizens from other states, and that worry would be the same whether it's a foreign corporation or a foreign individual. So I, I do think that the it's uh, it's it's not altogether clear that the rights aren't uh, at least in in part sometimes going to be claimed by collective organizations or collective groups. Am I, are those are my answers like going on on too too long? They're probably on too long, right? I'll try to get them shorter. Hi, my name is Bailey, and I'm a master's student here. And it seems to me that in making the decision to make a decision on Citizens United, the Supreme Court kind of ignored the canon of constitutional avoidance. And Absolutely I was wondering if you had any did. thoughts on that. Yeah, of course they did. That is, and that's an excellent point, Bailey. So the the doctrine of, of uh, uh, not really doctrine, so the canon of constitutional uh, avoidance is that you know, a, a court uh, shouldn't raise or decide constitutional uh, issues that they don't have to, right? And there were so many ways that the court could have decided since United uh, to avoid the constitutional issue. Uh, they could have uh, decided as a, uh, to say that the Hillary movie wasn't electioneering. They could have said, well, it was, um, Citizens United was not like other corporations. They could have done a bunch of bunch of things, uh, but they didn't because they wanted to decide the constitutional question. And like most canons, they they apply that canon and except when they don't, right? Um, yeah. Hey, my name is Nate. Um, Nate. I'm a one L. Um, one of my concerns about um, Citizens United was foreign and semi foreign corporations being given like an enhanced level of um, the First Amendment right in the United States. Um, so I was just wondering um, your thoughts on that. Yeah, so the, the court did not explicitly address that in Citizens United, and, uh, and that was one of the things that, if you remember, President Obama addressed, um, said to the, to, the, to the justices, to their faces you know, during the 2010 State of the Union, which was, I think was like the week after Citizens United. It was sort of a, it was high drama, like, you know, the president uh, uh, like shout, basically criticizing the court to their face. Um, and, you know, and honestly, this, I'm not sure how I come down on that. Uh, because, I, you know, the First Amendment is not one of the rights that are limited to citizens, right? If you are a, uh, um, if you are an undocumented uh, person in the United States, you have a right to speak. And so it's not a right that, that really flows from citizenship. It's a right that flows from uh, personhood and the right of people to hear what you have to say. So I think the, 
Um, it, the, I think there are different policy problems with it, uh, but I'm not, I'm, 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 I'm not sure what I think about it as a constitutional matter yet. Professor uh, Grief, welcome to Vermont Law School. And I'm yes. going to stay at a, a, a place here. I mean, you're welcome to stay at my home. Um, we live on a farm. It's beautiful, but um, Good. I'm going to charge you. But um, I want to talk about uh, Professor Warren's bill, the Accountable uh, Capitalism Act, yep. um, which I talked about in my corporations class, and uh, the students pretty much panned it. Uh, but I, I, I mean, I, I've got a lot of concerns about it. For first of all, um, do we want to take, first of all, the federal government micromanaging our corporations, which I think this bill tries to do. And secondly, um, what role would the states then play if this were enacted, which uh, I don't think is going to happen. But also, um, yeah, it's not, yeah, we agree on that. Yeah. <laughs> but, but the provision, it says, in discharging the duties of their respective positions and considering the best interest of the United States corporation, the board of directors and individual directors of a U.S. corporation to manage or direct the business of affairs of the U.S. corporation in a manner that seeks to create a general public benefit. And, and what does that mean? So it seems to me that this was tried in the Soviet Union. It didn't work out so well. So, so why, why, why specifically do you support this bill? Well, I, I don't think it, I don't think it is, uh, I don't think that it is uh, communism, right? That is, that is not, that is not uh, I think, the, the fair analogy. I do think, what, it, what, it, what I understand it to be saying. No, we, we don't fight fair there. Uh, is, is uh, I, I think what it's saying is that a, a director uh, can and should take into account more than just shareholder value. Right, and that now, whether, whether, now, whether the, and, and I do think that uh, there are other, there are other countries that require that, and there are some analogies here, even in the, 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 the states where companies have taken on that kind of role as a voluntary matter, public benefit co corporations, for example. Um, but I think what it does, at least that, I agree if part of your, part of your um, point is that we don't want courts adjudicating what a general public be uh, benefit or, or not is, but, I, uh, but maybe my response to that is well, at least this makes clear that directors could use, could act in, in, a, uh, in furtherance of public benefit in those moments in which they choose. But our, I mean, corporate law already allows that, right? Delaware, for example, says that directors can, can take into account other constituencies besides show, shareholders. Well, Delaware doesn't really say that, except in um, ex, 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 except except in, in takeover situations. In fact, Delaware is one of the one of the states that doesn't have that explicitly in the statute, right? They, they the uh, if you're talking about the time Unical. Um, well, but, but my fallback too is that you know a smart director, right? thinks about other constituents besides shareholders, right? I mean, you're doing well, Coca-Cola. Well, clearly they're doing that, right? Well, I, th I, think, I think you're right that a smart director does that, uh, but I'm not so sure that, that um, smart, let me just say it this way. I think it's pretty, I think it's pretty clear under Delaware law that if a, if a corporate director said, we are sacrificing shareholder value for, uh, and we're making the following decision, uh, for public benefit, and we know we're, we're sacrificing shareholder value. That would be seen under Delaware law as a violation of their fiduciary duty. Well, but, but that's not what a director would say, right? They, they'd make the case that... Well, they would have to lie about it. No, not lie, but, but I think a, a director would cast it in terms of, this is good for their... I mean, just like in Time Warner, right? The board of directors rejected a, a, a premium that was out of this world, over uh, <coughs> 60%. And they said that that was because of our interest in uh, providing news, basically. And, and that's very important to us, and we don't want to see that go away. And the Delaware Court bought that, right? As a viable reason. Yeah, although I, I, guess, I guess where we differ is that I, I would want uh, directors to be able to say, say that and be honest about it. Uh, you know, and you know, people like, like Leo Strine would say that, uh, you know, that it would be a violation of fiduciary duty for someone to make a decision based on public benefit uh, at the cost of shareholder value, and I think that, on balance, is a is a bad thing. And in terms of whether whether we should have a national incorporation law or a, or a state incorporation law, I am in favor of a national incorporation law. I, I don't I don't um, I, I I think that the rea I I am a believer that what we have witnessed in the last century is a race to the bottom, not a race to the top. Well, thank you, but I do agree with you that too much money is in politics. So, so thank you. All right, thank you. 
Thank, Thank you, Professor. Uh, my name is Kyle. I'm a 2L and a proud Boston University alum, if Great. you'll forgive that. Of course. Um, <laughs> you, you guys got a good hockey team. Yeah, we do. Uh, your, so, your football team is not so good. Uh, yeah, but undefeated since what, 93? <laughs> good. Because <laughs> um, there isn't one anymore. Right, that's yeah. so, sort of an inside uh, joke. Yeah, it's a BC My question joke. is. Uh, I hesitate to ask you to put on another hat in addition to corporations and, and constitution, but I'm curious what your um, idea of full corporate personhood would mean for criminal uh, liability. Um, I'm in white collar crime this semester, and um, so just interested how, how that intersects. Yeah, so, um, so and my, my wife is a, a white collar defense attorney, and I, so I, I think in a way, um, Corpora corporations ought to be persons in that space too, right? They ought to be held accountable for, uh, for, uh, for crimes. They ought to be held accountable for violations of tort. Uh, and, and I think there are, there are ways for um, the, the, those of us interested in crime, uh, or criminal law, and those interested in corporate law, actually you can come together because there's a, a doctrine called the ultra virus doctrine that is sort of not used much anymore in the corporate law space that I think makes it um, would make it actionable for shareholders to sue corporations if they know corporations are engaging in illegal activity, even illegal activity that's occurring overseas. So I've helped two lawsuits over the last decade, uh, actually over the last uh, 20 years, uh, it seems like a decade, but um, one against Unical for human rights violations in, in, in Burma, and one against Hershey uh, based on alleged uh, human rights violations of the use of child labor in West Africa. Hershey is actually not that, not, that great of a company to be buying your your, your Halloween candy from, um, and the, in fact we sued on behalf of I helped a, a union sue Hershey on the basis of um, uh, under this ultra virus doctrine, uh, arguing that that their use of child labor was a violation of human rights. Uh, the other thing to say about criminal law, I think corporations as persons, legal persons, ought to be subject to to treason. Uh, 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 charges as well, right? Treason, it doesn't say anywhere in the, in the Constitution that treason has to be committed by an individual. So let's just imagine if a company it's incorporated- It's also a capital offense, no? Um, yeah, it, it, yeah, I mean, I, I, does it have to be? But it could be, right? Like it's, it's um, but a tre treason, um, I mean, I'm mad, like, it's counterfactual, but imagine like a, if a company incorporated in the US like tried to like, subvert American democracy uh, by, by aligning itself with a foreign power. Um, like, like, it's sort of, like it's sort of counterfactual, but like it's hard to imagine, but I, you know, I could imagine a company being charged with treason for such things. Hi, Professor. Yeah. Uh, my name is Frank. I'm a 1L, and I'm a proud Boston College graduate. Go oh, nice. Nice. Warren, too. Thank you very Great. much. Um, I have a question on your comments on truthfulness uh, and corporate tr uh, the, uh, whether or not corporate corporations should be truthful. I'm, the, I'm curious about the extent of that and how it relates to a current case that's in, uh, in litigation in Massachusetts right now. Exxon, I believe uh, the Attorney General in Massachusetts has uh, won a case in which she wanted to seize 40 years of records of ExxonMobil's impacts on climate change. Yeah, it's a really important case. And so this is, a, this, uh, there, she's looking for corporate truthfulness in a, in a way that uh, might not relate directly to, the, to uh, the consumers to which the product's being sold. It's more, it's related to truthfulness and its impacts on the general populace. I'm curious to know if you think tr that truthfulness standard applies there as well. Absolutely it does. In fact, they, uh, they invited me to be a, a part of that amicus brief that was filed on by professors, and I just didn't get around to it last week, and I would have joined if I had, had gotten my stuff in order. Um, but the, the question, I think this is the climate change suit, whether Exxon and, and other energy companies are, are, uh, have purposefully failed to disclose or lied about uh, climate change information, and I think Maura Healy is doing, uh, you know, um, great work in this, in this space, and the Exxon is, is I think the response is, you know, they have a uh, a duty not to disclose, or a duty even, or that uh, they they can be excused excused from lying because they might have a First Amendment right. In my view, the First Amendment should not protect companies' uh, right to uh, not disclose things that are truthful. What about personal jurisdiction? That I don't know what to say about. Um, can you call on someone else, please? Um, <laughs> um, 
So um, the, um, the, the, um, but I will, I will say, so there's a bunch of other cases of, like this too. There was a provision in the Dodd-Frank uh, bill that forced companies uh, engaged in, um, that use um, metals, like, you know, basically, you know, your, in your, your, your iPhone, like whether they are using, it required disclosure of whether they're using conflict minerals from certain uh, countries in Africa that have uh, been mined in, in, in the, using slaves and other coarse labor. And the, those companies sued saying, look, we have a First Amendment right not to disclose this. And they won. They, and they, you know, the case that they cited, they cited uh, West Virginia v. Martinet, you know, like the, the school child who refused to say the Pledge of Allegiance. There's no fixed star in this, if there's a fixed star in this constitutional co constellation is that no official, high or petty, shall, shall determine what is orthodox in law, politics, religion, et cetera. So they say that their refusal to not disclose conflict, the, their use of conflict minerals, is like a school child saying, not saying the Pledge of Allegiance. That is not the right analogy. Right? And in part, it's not the right analogy because corporations have an obligation to be truthful in the market in ways that, and, uh, and to disclose things in the market in ways that human beings do not. That's one of the, re one of the ways in which corporations and human beings are different. Um, thank you. Uh, let, let me just say, I've been, I've, you know, I've been to a lot of law schools in, uh, over the course of my career in, uh, uh, and, but you guys are awesome. You guys are, are attentive. You ask good questions. You are uh, make me feel welcome. So uh, thank you for 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 coming.